Welcome back to the Trade Hacker Mindset Podcast. In this episode, I'm back for coaching session number three with Jared Tendler. Trading the markets can be difficult to master and seemingly just out of reach. Professional traders have a secret. Trading requires total mental and emotional control. It requires the Trade Hacker Mindset. Steve, great to see you. Yeah, good to see you as well. Um, we took a little bit of a break in between our last coaching session. It's been a couple months. Uh, so just to kind of catch you up a little bit, you know, I've, I've continued to do the the fact finding data collection worksheets. I, I mean, I haven't I haven't been doing them as much, but after our last session, I, I was doing them pretty consistently for about a 30 day period. And then also kind of one of the main focuses that we had had been talking about was the um, was the perfectionism one really related to kind of giving myself credit for what I had already accomplished. And in turn, as you mentioned, making it so that I didn't feel like I had to prove myself on doing trades that I shouldn't shouldn't be doing. So, um, so I've, I, I have continued to focus on that. I, I have kind of a, a sheet that I look at every morning, kind of in my pre-market routine. Uh, part of it is I've got a kind of a screenshot list of trades that I shouldn't have taken that, that didn't end up well. And then just to remind myself that this is what happens when you, when you go off the rails. Um, and so I've, I've been doing that and, and, you know, <laughs> that works 99% of the time, but I, I did have a, another situation where I kind of went off the rails and, and okay. did a trade that I, that I shouldn't have. And it, and it, it was a pretty big costly error. So we can, we can talk about that, but I'm happy to kind of jump in and start wherever you want to start. Yeah. I mean, I think anytime there's uh, uh kind of new strategies that are being implemented, it can be easy to like want or wish or hope that it's going to be kind of a cure. And then you're kind of never going to make mistakes like that again. And, you know, to make, you know, progress, like I said, to say like it worked 99% of the time, you know, would you say that generally speaking, kind of like net net comparison to like the months before we started coaching, you know, how big was the improvement overall, right? Even kind of factoring in that one, that one big costly trade. Yeah, it's 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 definitely been an improvement. I mean, I think, you know, for me the biggest thing is it's it's keeping it more front and center as a and having a having a process and a methodology to to kind of systematically keep it front and center um has, has certainly been a big big benefit. Great. So then we can kind of look at like, I mean, and this is true anytime, right? And I'm sure you do this with your trades individually is like, well, when there is a setback after having made some progress, like it's not going to happen randomly. And sometimes it could be that, damn it, like I was just not strong enough under those conditions to be able to kind of continue that progress. Um, you know, the emotional like charge there was just like kind of bigger and more dramatic than, you know, I've been kind of used to dealing with, or maybe there was a little fatigue involved or which can also certainly happen, which is that sometimes like another dimension of the problem, you know, kind of comes out and was not discoverable until you kind of collide with that trade with that situation. And so we kind of have to dissect it and see like, is there something else kind of going on here? And I, I couldn't give you percentages on like kind of generally what I see with clients, but like it definitely happens in some cases, just like shit, I'm, I'm making progress. Just like keep doing it. And in those situations, again, you just have to like work even harder because it is like kind of those last reps of, of a workout. And then in other times it like genuinely is like, damn, like there's something new here that I could not have foreseen. It obviously sucks to have to learn it this way, but frankly, like most of your lessons in this game, like kind of take that shape. So it's just kind of one more in that category and I'll, I'll be better for what I've learned from it on the other side. Yeah. I mean, in this situation, just to give you a little bit more detail, it was, it was basically, I mean, it was just kind of a random situation where I decided I thought I knew something mm -hmm. and on a directional basis, you know, the, the majority of my kind of mechanical trades are not direction based. They're more Delta neutral kind of range based trades. And, and I've 
I decided I, I knew something and I sized up and of course it, it immediately went against me and, and kind of what I, you, you we talked about at one point, I had a, a, an account with discretionary trades, primarily futures. And, and I was, I was kind of using that as my outlet and I, you know, trading small, being discretionary, being directional. And it was really helping kind of scratch that discretionary itch over mm -hmm. here. And, and therefore it helped me stay more mechanical on my, my other stuff, my main stuff. And that was, that was working great. And, and what I've, what I, as I kind of thought through what happened, you know, it, it, it seems to be a recurring theme with me over the years is that I can, I can open up that door to discretion. And for the first However long I can be very consistent. I can be very methodical. I can be very, keep my position size in check, but for whatever reason, and this is where I, I need your insight for whatever reason, once I open up that window, then inevitably I end up having a situation like this happen. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure if that means I just need to completely shut that window <laughs> or if there's something else that that can be done because here because here's the way I look at it too is you know when I'm when I'm doing it the right way my discretionary trading is very beneficial I mean I, I really think it enhances my other stuff because I'm more in tune with the with the market on a day-to-day -day, on a you know more intraday basis uh, so there there are a lot of benefits to it and it and my discretionary trading does well until I have this one off the rail moment. And so what, what are your thoughts on that? I, I mean, given what you just said, it's like, I think the, there's clear long-term benefit for you to be able to keep it. So to shut that door, you know, it, it could have some um, like kind of real cost to it, but obviously it would be better to keep that door closed if you're unable to remove the top end part, the top end mistake. So I think my first question in in like the aspirational like let's see if we can still crack this like it's not like uh, a done deal that you can never trade discretionarily again um the first question i have is do you know where that line is because i'm assuming that when you are in a good frame of mind and the discretion that you're able to uh the dis discretionary decisions or trades you're able to take are coming because there is some intuition that's present. Uh, and then that intuition sort of gets contaminated by some overconfidence. And, and like, so the question is like, can you define where that line is, where it goes from being authentic, real, genuine intuition to emotion pretending and masquerading as intuition? I would, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I, um, I think, I think what it really boils down to, to this specific situation and similar situations in the past is that there, there was nothing wrong with the trade that I took. Okay. Right. I mean, it, it was a, it was a pretty normal situation of, of any other kind of discretionary directional type of trade I've taken. The issue was I decided that I was going to size way up beyond what I normally do. Uh huh. So it's almost like I have to have, and I and I would I would play with my size some on 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 my discretionary trades, and and maybe that's maybe that's what it comes down to is that mm -hmm. I have to have some type of ironclad. Here's my position size, or here's the max position size that I can do. You know, I I don't know it. So it, it really came down to not necessarily the the actual trade or the setup I took. I, that was fine. It was just, it just really had more to do with the, the size. Nice. Okay. So do you have a sense as to what uh, creates that discretion? Right? And I would say as the intuition, right? What, what gives you the vision to see uh, probabilistic opportunities that you don't see in, in, in more of the mechanical style? So with with the directional stuff, it's it's really more just about finding specific levels, um, and it, it it there's a variety of things that I would I would look at. I mean, it, it could be the 
previous days, open, high, low, close. It could be um, the expected move area in the S&P 500 for the day and, and how it reacts off of those levels sometimes. And so it's, it's for me, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, I wouldn't, I'm not, I'm not I don't want to say I'm against, but I don't, I'm not a big indicator guy. I'm not a big mm -hmm. support and resistance. These are key levels and you know, the market's going to do this around these levels. Uh, I'm more of, okay, there are, you know, finding a level that might potentially create a reversal in price and then just managing risk around that level. Mm -hmm. And so, and so that's, that's kind of my whole methodology around directional trading is just finding a line in the sand. I mean, it could be a variety of different things and then, but it, but it really comes down to managing risk around that level because I don't, I don't believe that any level is better than any other level. Okay. And so then the, that thesis sort of gets blown apart when the sizing gets all Right. For some, for whatever reason, in that day, in that moment, I thought that level that I was taking was absolute. And therefore, I should size up on this one, I guess, is what I so, so I, I think I think that's that's how you like there. there's like the like the line. That's the deviation. So if you're talking about like drawing lines in the sand, we had to draw lines in the sand, you know, mentally also that that if you ever believe that a directional uh, thesis is absolute like you know that you're full of shit right uh because and we, we we don't need to explain why but i okay part of me is hesitating because I, I i'm i'm certain that there uh could be in the future trades that you have incredibly high conviction for and could size accordingly but until you get to the point where there's there's not like the real um risk of kind of bastardizing this you 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 have to that that just can't be something that you're allowed to to snack on right it's it's got to be cut off because the odds are right now probabilistically that it's like overconfidence is kind of blinding you to like the risk calculation there right and and so you need in my opinion i would say like a year or two with these types of trades where you can know that you're not making any of these mistakes right? and you have a very strong sense of when overconfidence is present. And then when, you know, two years from now, let's say you have incredibly high conviction, maybe you decide to size up by like 20 to 30%, which I'm guessing is not the increase in size that you took, right? We're not talking like two, three, five X. Right. A position size and and then over time when you have more experience proving that those instances of very high conviction that feel absolute sized up increasingly again doesn't have any evidence of overconfidence well then maybe you decide to increase uh sizing appropriately but it's again after a much longer kind of track record having you know really cut out the the overconfidence trades yeah I, I agree with that hundred percent. Okay. Yeah. So I, I mean, it seems for, if, I mean, it was, feels fairly straightforward. Does it feel that way to you in terms of it like, does? It, it's here? just, it's just something that, you know, I think I, I just kind of got a little bit wishy-washy with my position size of, of what I was allowed to take and what I was not allowed to. And like I said, it was just kind of one of those, it happens. And then, and then it's like, I come out of my blackout state. And I'm like, what, what just happened? Yeah. What, why did I do that? You know, you know, that kind of deer in the headlights kind of look. So, so yeah, it, it I, I agree. It's very straightforward. It, it's really just a matter of, okay, here's the position size that I can do. And I've just, you know, got to stick with that because, because if I do that, that type of trading is beneficial. If I do what I did the other day, it's obviously detrimental. Yeah. So I, I always like to reemphasize that word. If, you know, if I do X, Y, and Z, then, you know, this will happen because the, if can have at this point in our conversation, like a little bit of a wish attached to it, right. Or at least an expectation and an assumption that it will happen. 
And and so let's just be like razor sharply clear. How are you going to uh, improve and you know prevent from making that mistake again? Well, one one of the things that I've already done is I've kind of added to my pre market routine in my uh, you know list of things that I kind of my pre market mental routine of you know, just kind of saying out loud, reading out loud what I have on my sheet, which is, you know, my max, my max position size for directional discretionary trades is this. It's in big and bold. And I, I repeat it to myself in the morning now. <laughs> and, um, and that, again, it's kind of keeps it, keeps it more front and center. It's, it's, it's more of an absolute as opposed to, Oh, I, I might, I feel like doing this today. I feel like doing that today. So, so that, that's one thing that, that I've done. Um, so I would say that that's kind of the main thing I've done. Okay. Yeah. So I think the, the additional thing to add, cause it's going to happen is the impulse to want to fudge that like, Oh, well, here's a spot where that rule doesn't apply. And I mean, I, I think to maybe make it clean to say in 2024, uh, any impulse, to violate that rule is overconfident and like the perfectionism work could help to continue to reduce the need for that. Again, if you feel solid and about what you've accomplished and today and the strategy itself and where you're at, like, I don't need to size up here to take on additional risk that I'm not overconfident. Cause that's basically what you're betting on right now. Uh, and, and so that can be part of it. The other part of it is you know, we didn't get, too much into this but like if it's if it's overconfident you know you're basically believing that you can predict the future and i i think that's a, like a slight deviation from what you know you make your money on which is probabilistically making predictions of the future with enough risk management to make a good amount of money long term on that it's like i don't need to be right 100 percent of the time here Right. And if you start to feel that way, that, then that's kind of like you're turning into a psychic. And if you were really psychic. Uh, yeah, I was really psychic that day, I thought. Yeah, yeah. Then sort of a different deal. I I, I call this the shitty psychic. It's a, it's a very, very common flaw. So you could, you know, kind of inject logic, right? You could have the reminder from that, okay, I've had this this impulse, I have this thought like, okay, this trade today, I can size up. This is right. I know that I'm right. And the reminder is like, <laughs> you're not a psychic. You don't make your money this way. Uh, it could be as easy as calling that out. If the impulse doesn't die off by the end of the year, or really in the next like three, four months, then, then I think that's where you kind of go back to the drawing board and just, because you can still be very harsh and trying to correct it, even if you're not making mistakes. And I think this is a really, like a really important point for you and everybody listening. Like truly solving a mental and emotional problem of this category means that the impulse to violate that, that rule doesn't happen ever. Right. And, and the, the desire to change the rule comes from a, a logical, well thought out reasoned approach, not like this, like momentary, like, oh, okay, I'm going to die in this hill today. So if you have the impulse and continue to, and that logic and this perspective doesn't eliminate it entirely, then you can still dig into understanding more of what's driving it, what's creating it from an overconfident standpoint without actually making any mistakes. And, and that might be, you know, topic for a future, future conversation uh, for us. Or again, like you can just take that step back and, and really just ask those questions of like, all right, I know I'm not psychic. Like why else would I want to do this? Maybe it's all right. You know, there's a little bit of greed popping up here. Like I see other people maybe making a little bit more money than I am right now. Maybe it's a little bit of a drawdown scenario. Like you're just not chopping around sideways with PL, like there just, it could be situational things that are like driving you to want to make a, a lot of money really quickly, reasonable, or it could be something, you know, a bit more kind of performance flaw based of like the perfectionism popping up. It's like, well, 
you know, I want to make the, what I believe I deserve or what, 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 what I believe this trade can really do. And yeah, I don't want to, I want to make two X this because I think that's what it can do. Uh, so the perfectionism might pop up again. Um, but either way, right, just be aware of that impulse. If the impulse is dying off and eventually like, all right, in no circumstances, am I wanting to move that uh, size higher? Then you know that you're in a good shape. And then 2025 comes around. Maybe you create like a roadmap for how to size up in certain positions, knowing that there's not risk of uh, feeling that kind of psychic absolutism, that absolute, you know, this is going to pay off. And so, yeah, I might as well just 10X this because why not? <laughs> yeah, I agree. Okay. Let's take some notes here. Yep. Yeah. And I, I think it was, you know, those, those different things you mentioned. I mean, I think it was a little bit of all of those, you know, I think it was greed. I think it was ego, you know, or we all like to think, we know what's going to happen. We all like to think we know we're, we all want to be right. I think probably the perfectionism thing, you know, for whatever reason that day needing to prove to myself. So yeah, I, I think it was probably a combination of all those things. And, and it could even be also like having had a lot of success controlling it. You know, it, it sounds weird to say like, well, how could that produce a problem? But sometimes when we're having a lot of success, it, it like kind of gives us this false impression that we've got a little bit more leeway and licensed for bad behavior. Cause it's either you're playing with house money or you're, you feel like you're kind of past it. And so like, how could you be wrong here? And, and so, you know, uh, yeah, I would say, I would say in that particular situation, it, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't as much that because in that specific account, I was actually in a little bit of a drawdown already. Ah, and so it was more of a, I think subconsciously, I think it was more of a, I got to get, I got to get back. And this was, <laughs> maybe this is the way for me to do it all in one shot, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Which you would not be surprised is really, really common. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it is a measure of, of like kind of that deeper confidence to be able to know that you can like kind of get back to your high watermark or even, you know, beyond like the right way. And, and you don't need, cause like it's a classic, you know, looking for home runs is a classic signal of some lack of confidence. Right. And again, for you, it's super subtle, right? We're talking about kind of razor thin mental game edges here, but like, like doubling down on your process and on your execution in that spot is how you kind of get out of the drawdown the right way and and strengthen a process and skill set that's going to carry you farther into the future than if you were to magically kind of you know have that trade pay off let's say it did right you're at, i i would say that you're actually worse off yeah i agree yep. Yep. all right um, yeah i think now that now that i'm kind of thinking through that too i think you know part of it was some of my because some of my mechanical stuff hasn't been paying off this year as quickly as like, say it did last year. Um, you know, that I think that subconsciously again, kind of got me into, well, that's not working as well. Let me try this. Let me try this, you know, that kind of thing. But, but yeah, it was, it was totally, yeah. What you're saying totally makes sense. Yeah. Cool. But I mean, I guess the question is like now again, kind of that uh, if I, uh, apply this, like, do you feel like that's kind of the how, like how you're going to be able to uh, prevent a mistake like this from happening again? Yeah, I, I believe so. Yeah, for sure. Um, just to kind of pull one more thread here. Um, were there signs that the struggles piano wise on the mechanical side were beginning to kind of generate that desire to kind of make something work somewhere else like it kind of i mean I, maybe not in the moment you didn't see it but now kind of reflecting on it uh in the moment i definitely didn't see it but looking back it's pretty clear that i started to get a lot more loose with my discretionary trading both from right. a size and in 
and number of trades standpoint for sure. Okay. So I think it, it, again, you don't have to make the mistakes, just the impulses to want to do that. You know, that's where in a post-market, you know, kind of recap, you're just asking yourself like, all right, why, why, why are you even thinking about doing that? Now that you've got rules in place, it makes it a little bit easier to, to ask that question. If you don't have rules, then it's like, where's the feedback going to come from? Right. But now it's like the impulse to change size or even the number of trades, you know, that's where you can ask yourself the question of what's happening here and begin to get ahead of it and maybe create the awareness like, oh yeah, okay. I, I'm, I'm trying to make something happen because I don't feel great about my results this year or, you know, what that mechanical style is doing. Uh, and then you're going to make a clear choice. Like, well, you know, am I going to make adaptations there or is it just market conditions, you know, keep firing and eventually it will turn around. We know that or make some small adjustments. Uh, or do I want to actually see if I can like scale up this discretionary style of trading given the conditions, but again, doing it the right way, not kind of like random. and haphazard. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I, and after, after that happened, I, I was, I, I was basically kind of thinking, okay, I'm, I'm just going to be done discretionary trading. I just, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do it anymore. But the more I thought about it, that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the, it wasn't the, it wasn't the discretionary trade that I took. It was all about position size. And I, you know, I kind of whined about it for a weekend and, and, you know, slept on it and all that stuff and, and, and really decided, you know, it, it is a really good part of my trading. And so I decided by Monday, so this happened like on a, I don't know, midweek, the week before. So I kind of stopped and then uh, kind of thought through things, processed things a little bit more. And then, and then really, and then, just, and then jumped right back in Monday. And I kind of, I kind of just thought, you know what, as long as I just have my rules in place and my position size in place, I, I feel like kind of jumping right back on the horse is actually a little bit better than just kind of banning myself from doing it. Um, so that that's where I'm at now. I'm just, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm even using, you know, a much smaller position size than I, my normal position size was before and just kind of building that confidence back up in myself, really. Yep. Just smart. Yeah. And, and I think it's, I think it's a, a more sophisticated and hardy way to do it going forward, like to not just like, just like kind of hard chop off this thing. Um, you know, I, it's kind of like a, like an alcoholic, like can't drink. Like that makes sense, right? Because it's going to destroy your life. Here, I mean, it doesn't have to be as hard. Like you can go to a bar and not choose to drink, right? And that that uh, sophistication to be able to do that. I mean, tells... that, that just sounds miserable, though, doesn't it? <laughs> Going to a bar and not drinking. Like I've I've gone to a Chiefs game before and been the designated driver. It is miserable. <laughs> Bad analogy, then. <laughs> uh yeah so here you have the ability to 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 still have fun in those scenarios right because you've got some rules in place yeah that sure. that's just a more sophisticated way to do it yeah definitely okay um i mean other you know kind of mistakes or things that kind of talk out like other points of progression that are worthwhile to dive, dive into here uh i think it'd be interesting to hear you know because you you talk to so many traders or poker players or golfers or, you know, all the different <clears throat> types of similar psycho psychology related things. I'd be interested just to hear your perspective on how you see people dealing with, you know, if like I, like I mentioned in, in one of my accounts, I had, it has been kind of up and down and currently in a drawdown. And then the, the bad trade made that drawdown even worse. <clears throat> You know, for me, I'm I'm just I'm I'm still just continuing to kind of stick to my mechanics because I I'm pretty confident that I will kind of work my way out. But I, I'd be interested to hear kind of how you, you know, maybe different little things that other other folks have done or things that you suggest to other people of how they handle just a a, a regular drawdown in general. Yeah, I think the biggest problem, and and it's. It, it's still very true of golfers where, you know, the game is far more in your control than trading in poker, trading in poker. Like you have to have the ability to, to, to measure and recognize 
like the quality of your execution, your performance intraday and even over, you know, weeks at a time when you're losing and to do that accurately. And it's, it's a very hard thing to do. And, and that, and like people, you know, naturally measure themselves by the results in like lots of areas of society and certainly areas of performance and golf or in, in sports. So it's not wrong to do that in trading and poker, but I mean, I, I, like this analogy, I think has kind of made more sense to me lately, which is that like an individual trading day is kind of like, like one minute in a basketball game. <laughs> and so we're going to play 48 games or 48 minutes. Like it's, it's 48 trading days, man. Like, so you have a losing day. That's like, I, I missed the basket and, you know, and then my teammate fumbled, you know, like dropped a pass and went out of bounds turnover. Uh, you know, w- why would you overreact to those individual instances? But we, we do, because I mean, if we were to actually play a basketball game over 48 days, like it would be incredibly mentally taxing because you got to sleep on it. You got to, I mean, it's so, I, I think the challenge for traders and poker players is like, how well can we be just a little bit psychopathic where you're, you're really convicted around identifying for yourself what defines high quality trading like how do you know that you've performed well how do you know that you actually made a good pass but you know your teammate fumbled it which would be the equivalent of you know the market just not responding to that that trade how do you know that you actually took a good shot but like this one probabilistically just didn't go in like and that's going to happen right so what does Steph Curry do he just keeps shooting and you know there's been days where he's missed I think I remember seeing a stat like this is going back four or five years. And it, actually, I think it was a playoff game. He missed like his first 13 three pointers and then like made the 14th one like deep into the fourth quarter. And then he would kind of went on a run. It was just, like unconscious for the next, you know, four minutes. And they just they won the game, you know, easily. Like, how do you have the conviction to keep firing? And so a lot of that is, you know, Steph understands deeply that he's taking good shots. And if he didn't, he's going to clean it up. And there's a small mistake and fine. I'm not going to make that mistake again today in this game. Uh, But there's, there's just high conviction in, in like the execution. Um, So, you know, traders, poker players, like that can easily start to kind of wear on you day over day where you're sleeping on it. Now the doubt starts to creep in. Like, like, have I kind of lost it? Is it the market? Is it me? Not really sure. And so then you kind of start to hesitate on like a, like a juicy trade and you get in a little bit late or you like maybe have like too narrow of a stop. And then like, like a a good trade loses just because of how you kind of fumbled it. And then it starts to feel like, Oh, now, now maybe I am a little snake bit now because now you're kind of contributing to it. So there's like a mental component that gets like kind of layered on top of it all the while, like the strategy still is solid and sound, but my interpretation, my ability to perceive what's happening is already altered and mentally now is is kind of beginning to be the, the, the bigger problem. So to me, I think the way to really ground yourself and solidify yourself in the just shit storm of negative variance and false feedback that occurs uh, in trading and poker is to do what I call an A to C game analysis, where you're actually spending time defining what your A game looks like, both mentally and from a, from a strategic, strategic technical basis, right? How do I know qualitatively that I am in an A-game mentality state? Because you can be in your A-game while having like pretty bad results, right? You're never going to have like, you know, be in an A-game and be trading badly, but you can have a lot of poor results knowing that you literally have done everything you could. Um, I had, I had a, a poker client who, um, this is actually going back like 12 years ago now, and um, the main event of the World Series of Poker Europe, Right. So they kind of created this, you know, kind of European version of the World Series of Poker, which is the biggest festival in the world. You know, he's playing for millions of dollars. Um, He ends up busting in fifth place. And he had one of the most remarkable interviews I've ever seen because the interviewer was actually crying because of how well he played. And she felt so bad because of how well he played. And he was happy. I mean, we're talking like fifth place in a tournament like this. It's like really scaled up. Like I don't remember the exact numbers, but he might've made, let's say like 200 grand and first place was like 2.4. Right. I mean, so 
uh, but he was happy because he 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 was in the zone. He could not have played better. He was making some incredibly sick reads, and just felt amazing about it. So like it is possible. It's not easy. Like he and I worked for years to get to that point. But the A to C game analysis was a really like kind of key part of that. And so you're defining your A game, your B game, and your C game, right? So like, what does your worst trading look like mentally and technically? Right. What does your average trading look like? You know, ten, that tends to be like, I have the impulses for bad behavior, but can avoid them. Or I make a couple small mistakes. You know, they're not like, you know, they're just like kind of paper cut stuff. So when you kind of have that like written out, you've you've created an objective measuring stick for yourself. Because one of the one of the dangers is if you're relying on your subjective analysis at the end of the third losing day in a row, like you're biased. I, I don't care who you are. You're going to have a negative slant. It's going to be really hard to say, yes, I was trading properly when you just lost you know, and just, and, and for the third day in a row. So you have this objective thing that you can actually print out or look at on your computer and say, did I check these boxes mentally? Like, was I like really focused? Did I have high conviction? Um, and then, you know, technically, strategically, like, did all my trades fit this criteria? And if you can say yes to all that, well, then you literally did everything you could. And at that point, if you're having some doubts and some uncertainties that are not based off of some uh, questions about the market that might, you know, want you to consider some adaptations or some adjustments you can make based on market conditions, which I think are reasonable to have. They may be wrong objectively, but you might eventually kind of get to that and, and say, no, all right, no, I'm going to stick with this and that's it. But my point is like, if it's not that and you're continuing to have doubts or frustrations, insecurities, uh, you know, some itchiness to kind of want to have like tomorrow be a great day, then you know that you're no longer mentally and emotionally stable and that that's where you have to now do some work. So as I was saying earlier, where that deviation starts to become self-inflicted, sorry, the losing starts to become self-inflicted, that, that's where you're now in danger of. But the A to C game analysis will help you to identify that now it's like time to shift into mental game work to make sure that you don't like compound the losses. But that A to C game analysis is like the anchor. And I would say that uh, it's one of those things that like kind of take a few weeks to, to like actually work through. You know, you sit down and do a draft today, you could spend five minutes and you could very quickly identify some of the more obvious parts of your mental game and, you know, kind of technical tra trading. Uh, but, you know, you iterate on it for a couple of weeks. So like really feel like it's not going to change because the reality is like you can't make significant progress mentally or strategically like within a month, even sometimes three months. So now you've got this objective measuring stick that you can use for the next three months. And then at the end of those three months, you can look back at it and say, all right, where did I, where did I improve? What did I evolve on? Because sometimes maybe your C game hasn't changed at all, but you've now created some new dimensions of your A game. Or maybe sometimes your C game has improved significantly. It's like, all right, well, now I don't have to worry about that stuff anymore. And the scale kind of gets re um, reevaluated and, and, and adjusted to, again, reflect your current current skill set. Because that's, what that's what's important to kind of maintain the longevity of this. If you only do it once in January and then don't do it again in November, like you are going to experience the same kind of ups and downs that you were experiencing earlier in the year or in years past, again, even having done the work. Like, so it's not like a one and done kind of thing. It's like you really need to have it as an anchor point that you're using to create that measuring stick throughout the year. And I either filled that out or I remember seeing you have some worksheets on that A to C game analysis, correct? Yeah, it's it's I talk about it in the book and then it's yeah, I've got worksheets on my website. Okay. And do you do you see people updating that once a month, once a quarter? What like as from a trading perspective, what do you what are you seeing the most productive? Yeah, I think if you're a full time trader, um you can you can reevaluate it once a month. The odds are you're probably not gonna update it um every month. It might be more like, you know, ten to you know. 10 to 12 weeks, I think probably close to closer, closer to quarterly. That doesn't mean that you can't, like if you're going through a period of significant, like like you're really aggressively trying to improve your mental game, then yeah, you know, it may, you know, you might see some distinct changes monthly. But if you're really 
in a mode of like smaller adjustments, smaller refinements, uh, then it's it's unlikely to change, uh, you know, within a quarter uh, in, a, in a measurable way. Gotcha. All right, cool. That's perfect. I, yeah, that, that's something that I need to reevaluate. I know I, either when I read your book or was going through the worksheets, I, I thought about it or did it. I don't know which, <laughs> but I, either way not, I need to, need to reevaluate it. You're not alone, man. I mean, I, like, I think a lot of times it's, it's like hard for people to prepare for, um, like tough times when things are good. You know, I, I, 99 clients out of a hundred come to me when they're struggling, you know, and it's the rare one. that's like, dude, I'm crushing it right now. I want to keep this going. <laughs> you know? So my point is that like, this is something that you should be doing, not when you're in the drawdown, like do it now or like do it when you're in a good spot. Like, cause then you're going to be able to measure and see your A game more clearly, which kind of gives you a target. Right. A to aim at regularly. It's like, oh, I want more of this. Like how the how am I going to do it? And then you can kind of start to look at what parts of your routine are really important to helping to produce that more often. You know, and, and so if you wait until you're struggling, it's too late because your mind's already compromised. So you, you kind of have to have a little bit more of the foresight and the willingness to say, all right, I'm going to commit myself to spending five minutes a day on this thing for the next two weeks. That's literally all you got to do. But sometimes <laughs> that simple task gets e easily overrided when you just kind of like slide into your normal rhythm and routine, like doing this new thing that you're not really sure is going to work and can be a little confusing and hard at times. It's just easy to ignore. But I I'm telling you, it's it is easily, I think, the most valuable tool to have in general. Right. It's it can significantly improve your mentality in drawdowns, but also when you're killing it right and you're in that rush and and because i can't tell you the number of times i see traders who will tell me they like the kind of the boom and bust cycles where they've got you know two three months or two three weeks where they're just crushing it and then have that one trade right like you you described that just kind of nose dives that progress and then you got to kind of clean up the mess well we don't want like what you don't need that to kind of wake you up to say dude your process, your routine, your execution got off, right? In that overconfidence, you got loose, but it's hard to see it. You've got the A to C game analysis. You can, you can def like actually recognize when you're making mistakes while you're making money. And that is like real power because now you can actually keep climbing uh, at least as much as you can control uh, during that period in, in a, like a reliable way. And the, the likelihood of a significant setback, uh, or drawdown from there and decreases significantly. I like that. I, in fact, that, I mean, that was kind of my whole basis when I first reached out to you was I was actually, you know, I was in a really good place and I was like, I don't want this to ever go away. You know, so I want to, I want to continue to build on that. You know, how good, how good can I be kind of a scenario? And of course, run into a few little snafus along the way, but, but yeah, I, I, but I agree with that comment. Like, I think, I think only digging into this when you're in a negative space is completely different than if you can dig into it while you're in a good space. Right, so yeah, I'm with you on that. Cool. cool. Yeah. So, um, what other things you want to discuss today? I, no, I can't think of anything. Um, yeah, that's really helpful. I throw into is just like the, the, just to follow up on the data collection worksheet. Um, like during that time where you're doing it regularly, did you find new stuff? Like, was it a valuable thing to do regularly or is it something you could do? I'm kind of saying this as a bit of coaching because I'm suspecting this is the case, you know, just kind of do spontaneously kind of in response to when you recognize some deviation. So if you do the A to C game analysis, like the data collection worksheet can be the tool that you use anytime you're slipping from a game, you know, and, and even again, just like kind of having those impulses to want to size up or to want to, you know, jump into something prematurely or wh whatever, you know, like some little bit of little bit, little bits of FOMO, uh, again, any deviation can be that, you know, response, like, all right, data collection, let me just kind of capture it. And then it either is going to help me to refine my A to C game, or it's like, no, no, okay. I just know that that's where exactly it fits in. And I can now, you know, react to my B game 
from an A-game standpoint, if that makes sense. Like, like Tiger was an expert at like managing his C game and his B game better than anybody ever had before. Hmm. Right. And he recognized like, I'm not going to be perfect all the times. So I'm going to, there's going to be times where I suck, but there's not going to be anybody on the planet who's going to better manage that game than me. So for some traders, it gets bad enough where you've got the luxury, you can quit, right? You should get the hell away from the screens. Tiger's in the middle of the tournament. He doesn't have that luxury. But there are other times where it's like, oh, look, I just need to size down. I need to take fewer trades. I need to really look for just the absolute A plus trades. Like you can start to manage, like you don't have to be in a perfect mentality at all times. But provided you recognize the deviation, you now have another data point that allows you to kind of manage your risk in like an emotional risk management kind of way. Yeah, I like that. Cool. Cool. All right. I appreciate you, Jared. That was awesome. That was that was really Please. helpful. Um, Good stuff, dude. Yeah, happy to help. Well, let's let's end this with a little plug for you, my friend. Okay. If, you, if, you, if you're not following Jared, I'd suggest you get on his, you know, read his blog. So tell tell us, just give us the quick and dirty of what you're doing golf wise. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, I'm kind of dusting off the uh, the clubs a little bit here, and uh, you know, trying to make a go at uh, some serious kind of high level golf. Uh, you know, I played in college, was three time All American. Um, you know, but then kind of got derailed by my own mental stuff. Anyway, long story short. Uh, you know, 45 now, I want to play some high-low golf before, you know, body doesn't really let me to. So I spent the last couple of years really, really rebuilding my body and getting some some distance and speed back. And now uh, just qualified for, you know, a, a nice little tournament locally here in Philly. And I've got the U.S. Open qualifier, the local qualifier uh, coming up in a few weeks. So excited about all that. And uh, so that, so that local it. qualifier. So if so, what do you have to do in that local qualifier to make it to the U.S. Open? How does that work? Yeah, so I have to finish. So there's 120 guys. Uh, this specific qualifier will have seven spots available. Um, and if I finish in those seven spots, which based on the golf course, you know, if, you know, conditions are what I'm expecting. If I shoot anywhere between two to three under par, I'll probably either get in or, or get into a playoff. Uh, and if I qualify, uh, then I'm just moving on to sectional qualifying for the U.S. Open. But the cool thing about the U.S. Open, right, it's an open tournament. This isn't like the PGA Tour, although the PGA Tour does have qualifying, um, but it's incredibly demanding. Not that this isn't either, but um, there's just far more amateurs that end up making it into the U.S. Open than, than regular PGA Tour events. Um, so in sectional qualifying, I will be surrounded by PGA Tour players um, because the U.S. Open only has around 80 of 156 spots that are exempt you know, previous winners, you know, guys in the top 50 in the world. Like there's a number of kind of categories for it, but guys that I coach on the PGA tour, like they are in these qualifiers. So it's kind of crazy. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, like it, to me, that, that would be like as much of the goal. I mean, obviously I do want to play in the U S open, but to be able to get through to, to sectionals um, would be an incredible accomplishment. And, um, and then, and I'm then, doing. so you make it to sectionals. Yeah. Make it to sectionals. What, what do you have to do in that tournament to get in? Yeah, so there's there's a, a number of different ones. Um, like the one that occurs in Ohio just after the memorial is like chock filled with PGA Tour players. So there might be like 100 players there and they're going to take like 25 spots because they know how hard that field is. Um, but then the other ones that occur, I think there's a total of seven or eight around the country. Uh, and the one that I would go to would probably be in Maryland and there might be 120 players for like four or five spots. Uh, and at that point, you got to shoot like anywhere between seven to 15 under uh, to get in. And it's 36 holes one day. So they call it the longest day in golf. Let's it's go. uh, very, very early in June. But, you know, it's kind of like uh, like in poker. You've got like a satellite into the main event. Well, this is a satellite into a satellite into the main event. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in the best spot that I've ever been in to be able to make this happen. Uh, if I fail this year, it wouldn't be a surprise uh because i feel like i'm knocking on the door but you can damn well bet that another year uh i'll be in an even better spot physically you know and and also with my golf swing um got some new clubs which i, I never would have thought that like kind of buying progress would would really occur i thought i was just kind of get it, getting like a lateral move with these sort of new irons but i didn't realize how much these new irons are actually fit to me and that was the reason that i i shot so well in that in that previous tournament that i won because in the wind, like you have to hit the ball perfectly uh, to control uh, ball flight and trajectory. And 
yeah, uh, these clubs are like really reduced my miss, which was like a, a bigger draw. And especially with longer irons, which you're hitting, you know, low uh, into the wind a lot. Uh, I, I was like, it was a, a, like a significant improvement in how well I was able to control the ball. So yeah, kind of try, trying to check all the boxes here, but yeah, if you want to follow along, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, kind of cataloging my journey here also to be a little bit accountable to myself to make sure I'm working as hard as I need to be. Uh, but also to kind of share, you know, some of the things that I'm doing, because I think it's helpful to, you know, not just kind of talk about it, but also walk it. So, um, and then I could mentioned on jaredtendler.com, I've got these worksheets available, which you can freely download, you know, get access to my newsletter, my blogs there. Um, I've got um, a trading, you know, kind of coaching community called the Mental Game of Trading Live, which there's information on the on the website for that as well. Awesome. Well, I'm, I'm excited to see where you go with the golf thing. I've, I've been kind of reading along your, your blog post. So keep those coming. I like it. Awesome. Will do. Thanks, Steve. All right, Jared. It's been great. We'll talk to you soon. Good stuff, man. Be well. Take care.